Okay, sacred families, developing the family according to God's design, preparing for teen parenting, lesson six, by the way, in the series, preparing, preparing, that's the key word here, for teen parenting, this is part one. I'm going to start with a book. In his book, entitled Teen Proofing, psychologist John Rosemond talks about the work that goes into parenting before your children become teens, before they become teens. And his point is that if you do the hard work of parenting when your children are young, you're going to have less problems when they reach those teen years. I think you know, all parents probably know that already, but uh, he underscores the importance of this. Uh, I, I, can, I can highly recommend his, uh, no non, his is a no-nonsense, old-fashioned you know, approach to uh, to parenting. Um, by training, he's a family uh, psychologist who has rejected much of the modern psychology's uh, notions of parenting in favor for more common sense and traditional ideas about raising children. Uh, much of uh, this presentation uh, actually is a synopsis of the, the first part of this uh, material in his book. So here's the problem. <clears throat> 100 years ago, there was no such thing as teen culture. Didn't exist. No such thing as teen culture 100 years ago. Uh, what do I mean by teen culture? Uh, adolescence with income, with money to spend. Uh, media devoted exclusively to teenagers. Uh, marketing and products directed exclusively to teens and preteens. You, know, you got guys sitting in a room, guys and girls, sitting in a room figuring out a marketing campaign aimed at 10 year olds. Didn't exist 100 years ago. Uh, youth ministers, no youth ministers. Counselors that specialized in teens, didn't have that. So what we've created in the last century is a significant portion of society that has an enormous expectation of leisure, freedom, and buying power without the corresponding checks and balances of accountability, responsibility, and most importantly, productivity. I want money, I want, spend, I want to spend it, I want to be free to do what I want to do, but I, I myself don't produce anything. It's one thing if you're working 75 hours a week and you buy yourself a boat for the day or two, you, you, know, you go on vacation to go fishing, you know what I'm saying? Because you're putting in that 75 hours. So what parents have today is a six to eight years of expensive parental maintenance with little return in productivity. Now it wasn't always this way. The teens of the early 20th century spent their time integrated into the family as junior partners in helping to maintain the home. Not helping to maintain their wardrobe or their video games. They were helping to maintain the home in which they lived buying the food which they ate, and so on and so forth. It was common uh, in my father's day, my father, that generation, that teens worked after school and summers to provide additional income for their families, not necessarily for themselves. And I'm you know, old enough to remember when I was a teenager working, you know, uh, in my case at a dry cleaners after school, I think it was 11, 12, something like that. I was the counter boy, you know, go get your dry cleaning, and 35 cents an hour, 50 cents an hour. And I remember coming home with my salary for the week, you know, $11 or something like that, and giving it to my mother, and she would give me back $1 for my, you know, I'd go to the movies, let's say, Saturday night or something like that. And here's the kicker, I didn't feel oppressed by that. I mean, my friends, they were doing the same thing. They were working and giving the money to their parents, and their parents were, you know, it was part of the family income. That was the norm. Fathers taught sons a trade, or a business, or farming, 
and women learned homemaking skills from their mothers. Now, don't get me wrong, I, I'm not saying we have to go back to this because times have changed and the makeup of families and work and home have changed. What I am saying is that with this change to teen culture, we've created a generation of young people who are, as Roseman, these are his words, and he's probably a little biased because he sees the problems, okay? He says, um, we've created a, a generation of emotional toddlers, irresponsible, narcissistic, and oblivious to risk. Uh, it's this generation, you know, the, the, just do it, or why not? In other words, the, the, uh, the reason for doing something risky or dangerous is, why not? <laughs> and there's nobody there to say, because you may be, you, know, you may kill yourself, or you may maim yourself, or you may become addicted to this particular thing for the rest of your, you know. So it's not that you, the parents, especially Christian parents, want your children to be this way. It's that without serious parental intervention, this is how today's society will turn them out. That's the problem. Modern society is not a good partner when it comes to raising Christian children. That's the problem. You've got the right values. You know what you want as Christian parents. The problem is school is not confirming your values you know, at school. When I was a child, what my mother said I had to do pretty much reflected what my teacher said I had to do. They were in concert. They never met each other, but they could be pretty sure they were in concert. That's that's not always the case, especially when they get up into junior high and high school. So modern society, as I say, is not a good partner when it comes to raising Christian children. For example, uh, we live in a climate of moral relativism. In other words, sexual practices that were considered unacceptable and morally deviant 50, 60 years ago are now morally neutral. My daughter and I went on a trip this past week to her college, it was her graduation, I had to get that in. And um, uh, we happened to be in the airport and, and we saw a picture of a young woman, very pretty young woman, wearing you know, practically nothing, you know, underwear and a bra or something. And I mean a huge, you know, six foot high by four foot across color picture close up of this woman. And, I, and we're walking by and I said, you see this here? This would have been considered pornography 100 years ago. This would have been porn 100 years ago. Now it's like, pfft, it's nothing. Little children are going through the airport, you know, seeing how many images of near nakedness. You know, a, a girl in a high school back home made a complaint to the teacher and to the principal that there were two girls, two girls who were kissing, you know, romantically kissing in the, in, the, in the hallway. And she objected to that type of behavior. Guess who was censored? Guess who was punished? Not the two girls, the one making the report was punished. She was accused of being prejudiced against the gay lifestyle, censored by the school. So today, teens exchange sexually suggestive or explicit pictures of themselves you know, with phones and tablets, whatever. I would say today, today's youth, they simply applaud sexual immorality. Look at the heroes. The young women who are the stars, for example, the media stars today. Not exactly examples of sexual purity respecting themselves, but they're the heroes. You, you, you get young men, young women around the block to go to see a concert of a young woman who may have a lot of talent, you know, singing wise and you know, talent for, 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 for performing, that a hundred years ago that performance would better be in a strip club or a gentleman's club the type of dancing and the clothing and so on and so forth, you know, it would have been not acceptable at all. It would have been a no-brainer today. <laughs> What's worse, you have parents bringing their children to that concert. 
We have weakened disciplinary practices, you know? I mean, children taking parents to court. Teachers not allowed to discipline their students. Not allowed. A 16 year old can murder somebody in cold blood and be walking the streets again when they're 20. And of course, I, and I think this is the worst right here, overheated materialism. There's always materialism. We got to buy stuff, right? I mean, people have had to buy food and you know, food for their horses. No matter what generation you're in, there's always materialism, always. You, know, you have to eat. I'm saying overheated materialism. Parents cannot keep up with the demands of their children who are stimulated by 24-7 media barrage to buy stuff. I mean, the eight-year-old wants their own phone. Never mind, they want their own Facebook page. <laughs> and so raising children, especially in their teen years, is very difficult in this type of climate. Very difficult. When our children reach this stage, you know, meaning when our children reach the stage of you know, getting into the teen years, we want to prevent we want to prevent them from becoming secretive and uncommunicative to us. We don't want that to happen. We don't want them to become overly argumentative and defiant with us. I don't care what you think. I don't care. I'm going to do it my way. Well, you're grounded. Well, I don't care. You know, we don't want that attitude. We don't want them to fall in with the quote wrong crowd. We don't want them to use drugs and abuse alcohol and become sexually active or we don't want them to run away. We don't want them to harm themselves. We don't want them to take foolish risks. We don't want them to become depressed. We don't want them to become suicidal. We don't want them to binge watch a program that's about suicide. That's the biggest program on TV at the moment. What is it, 13 reasons? That it? We don't want them. I mean, have I covered all of the fears that parents have? We could keep going here. So what we want to develop while they are still young is a parenting model that will eventually produce two things when they become teenagers. Number one, we want them to develop, we want their, excuse me, want to develop their character in such a way that they take responsible control of their lives when they are teenagers, not when they grow up and they're married and they're gone. We want them to be able to do that while they're still teenagers. And number two, we want to help them make self-protective rather than self-destructive decisions as teenagers. Again, a lot of parents think, well, that's what I want them to be when they're adults. Too late, <laughs> too late. You want them to be able to do that while they're teenagers. These two are the holy grail, if you wish, of teen parenting. But the work to achieve these two goals begins long before your child becomes a teen. Here are three basic stages from birth to adulthood that children go through and how we parent them during the first two periods, rather how we parent them during the first two periods will have an impact on what kind of teenagers they become and what our parenting experience will be like when they are teenagers. So I want to briefly go over these before we talk about parenting teens, which I'll do in the next session. Stage one. Stage one is infancy to early toddlerhood, somewhere around two or three years old. During the first two years of life, the child is treated like he was the center of the universe. Total strangers will kneel before his throne just to get a smile, right? Parents are there to serve and quickly. <laughs> I want it now. I want it now. I don't care how you feel. I want it now. Of course, this is normal because the child needs caring for and is aware only of his own central position 
in the world. He, she, you know, you know what I'm saying. But then at around two years of age, a revolution should begin. Parents begin, or should begin, to shift roles from caretaker to authority figure. Now, parents begin to teach right from wrong, obedience, discipline. We usually call this time the terrible twos. And we call this time the terrible twos because the child does not like this new order of things where mommy says no 500 times a day. <laughs> right? The change that must take place is that the child is no longer at the center of his universe. The parent is. The parent becomes the center of his universe. From now on, the child will pay more attention to the parent, meaning respond to or accommodate, than the parent towards the child, cater to, cave into. From about two years onwards, the child must be made to understand that the parent is in charge, not the child. Sounds so easy, doesn't it? But that's the task, that's the job. You're wondering, what am I doing? What do I have to do? That's it. What are my objectives? That's it. Now you know this is taking place when the child puts the parents at the center of his or her attention. When the child looks to them for definitions of right and wrong, like should I do this? Or, you know, they're about to do something, then they look at the parent you know, thinking, is this going to be okay? You see, before this happens, they just do what they want to do. They go in, there's, there's fresh cookies you know, baked before supper. They climb on top of their, their bikes and they get to the thing, knock over the cookie jar, they're eating. Not even a thought. You know? But when the revolution happens, all of a sudden, it's like they go for it and then they, they look around to see, you know, mommy, dad. You see, you know it's happening because now they're looking to see, is this okay? Is this okay with mom and dad? You know the revolution is happening when the child feels secure that his parents are able, willing, and actively taking care of him and protecting him. When the child seeks their approval, wants to please them. When the child finds his identity within the family. In other words, I'm the big brother, or I'm mommy's helper, or I'm daddy's girl, that's good. As I've already stated, at this stage the goal for parents is to go from caretaker exclusively to authority figure. Of course, we're still caring and nurturing for the child, but we're adding the dominant element of authority. Authority is good. Unfortunately, many parents are unwilling to pay the price to force their children from one stage to the other. They fail to apply the pressure needed to force the unwilling child out of infantile self-centeredness. You have to force them out of that. They're not going to go by themselves. They will stay in that mode forever if you don't push them out of it. They cater, parents do, they cater, they cave in, they cop out, they run away, they give up. Hey, let, let's just let daycare handle it. Uh, you know, I know, brutal. How many times have I heard young parents say, whew, I've, I've gone back to work, oh, I love my job. And what they're really saying is, <laughs> I like this job way better than that job. <laughs> I like my job as a paralegal a whole lot better than I like my job of forcing my toddler out of his terrible twos into a more mature position. That's much harder work, I'd rather go to work. Let daycare handle it, let grandma handle it. The result are children who are self-centered, selfish, undisciplined, and antisocial. I tell our daughters, and they, well, all of our girls in our family, they have children in this age range, that they're at the bricklaying stage of parenting. Like bricklaying, Dealing with children going through this transition is hard physically. It's tedious and it's seemingly endless. But every no, and this is important, 
every disciplinary action seen to the end. And every repetition of the rules is like laying one brick. Eventually the 10,000 bricks you are carefully laying down form a solid wall, something that can withstand pressure, something that you can then build on. If you persevere in this task during this period, then you will have well prepared your child for the next stage of development. The next stage of development is the early and middle childhood stage from three to 11. Now, there are goals in parenting children at every stage of their development. So when we're confused and tired and we feel defeated, we should review these goals so that we can be reminded just what it is that we're trying to accomplish as parents. Of course, sometimes our strategies might change, you know, the things that we do to reach our goals, but the goals themselves always remain the same. For example, the goal in the toddler stage is to establish your authority and your child's positive and steady response to it. That's the goal. When mommy says no or daddy says no, it's no. Now, you may have to use a whole bunch of different strategies you know, to enforce that, depending on the child, not all children are the same, but the goal is always the same. You will obey you will respond the first time. You will do what I say. I know it sounds, oh, is that terrible? What about the child's feelings? Don't worry about that. <laughs> you will not regret doing this. Your strategy to achieve, as I say, may have to change from time to time. Sometimes, you know, oh, time out is not working. Well, then go to some other form of discipline. I think I've mentioned this before. My mother, she had a real doozy of a thing to get my attention when I was six or seven and misbehaving, whatever. She was all of a sudden, out of nowhere, you know, it was like, okay. Okay, pajama time. <sighs> Two o'clock in the afternoon in August. Pajama time, what that meant was I had to get out of my play clothes and go put my pajamas on and go sit on my bed. No toys, no books, no, nothing. Just sit on the bed and I'll let you know when you can come out. And it wasn't like, Ma, could I come out? Okay, now will you be good? No, 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 no. An hour would go by. I would have gone through crying, begging, pleading until I accepted she could keep me there forever. And then finally, you know, and I remember one time on the door outside, Mr. Mazzalongo, we're all going to the park to play ball. You know, we got, is Mike coming? Or uh, could we borrow his glove then? You know, she says, oh, Michael is, uh, you know, in French, of course, but she says, you know, uh, Michel, uh, you know, Michael is on his bed in his pajamas. <laughs> you know, oh, add ridicule. <laughs> I don't recommend adding ridicule, but. I could hear them and here I was in my pajamas in the middle of the day. She could have just said time out in the corner. No, 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 no. Just to impress upon me that she was in charge. And you know what? She was a working mom. I spent a whole lot of time alone in my life. You know, as a kid, you know, going to school, coming home, had my own key, opened the door, get my snack. You know, I had to wait till six o'clock till she came home but I never crossed her. <laughs> yeah. She didn't even have to raise her voice. I don't remember my mother ever yelling at me, ever. So in the next stage of development, which is the early and middle childhood stage, there are several goals that you're shooting for. Roseman says, and there's the quote, during infancy and early toddlerhood, parents are responsible mostly to their children. Now, during early and middle childhood, parents are responsible to both their children and the rest of us. He means that the goal is to properly socialize children so they will be able to interact with others outside the family circle. I'm not going to give you the strategies here, 
They're different from child to child, but here are the goals that you are aiming for during this period of time. By the time your child enters adolescence, he or she will have learned the following principles. Number one, you, the child, are completely responsible for the choices you make. God has given you free will and the exercise of that free will largely determines what happens and what will happen to you. Parents need to reinforce the idea that their child's behavior is due to their own choices, not their genes, not their father's alcoholism, not mom's cancer, or the fact that the family has too much money or not enough money. In the end, the choices that they make are very important and they have to take ownership. You, know, you ate all your candy before we actually went into the movie? Well, there's no more candy during the movie. Your choice. I told you, you know, the small popcorn and the box of the milk duds you know, and, and the drink, that was, for, that was for the two hour movie. And while we waited 15, 20 minutes in the, you know, to get in and sit down, you gobbled all that stuff up and you got none left and now you're, you know, oh, I got none, what is it? No, you, your choice. You made that choice. Number two. Lesson, if you make bad choices, bad things will happen. Not always right away, but sooner or later. The religious instruction we give our children actually lays the groundwork for this truth, but we can reinforce it in everyday circumstances by not always covering their losses brought about by their bad decisions. I'll cover a loss for my child brought about by my bad decision. You know, they had a special day, we were supposed to go so and so, and then I forgot about that and I said okay to my boss that I would work that, you know, my bad, I forgot I made that promise. I'll, I'll get home, I have to go to work, you know, but I'll make it up to you, because that was my fault, that was my, my bad. So we'll figure out a way, you know, I'm going to recompense you. But covering their loss, because they made a bad decision? I'll give you an example. Mom says, don't leave your bike in the yard at night. It might be stolen. Nothing happens for months. And you know, the daughter, she leaves the bike out, she leaves it on the sidewalk, she leaves it on the side of the house, she leaves it in the backyard out of just neglect or laziness. And then one morning she gets up and guess what? It's gone. But here's the thing, it's one day before the big bike-a-thon at school where you come and show your bike off and you do you know, around the track you know, and, and raise money and you win chocolates and it's a big thing, oh no, I don't have my bike. Covering her loss instead of letting her own her loss, that's a beginning of something we call enabling. If a child doesn't learn that bad choices bring bad consequences at this early stage, imagine the problems awaiting her when she's a teenager and she's driving your car, not just her own bike. Now remember, you know, I've got 30 minutes here to do this lesson. I can't cover every exception, obviously. We're not going to allow a child to make a bad decision that'll put their life at risk. You know. We're the parents, we ought to have the wisdom to know which things, you know, which failures will we allow them to undergo in order to teach a valuable lesson or not. Number three, so the, what am I trying to teach my kid? You're responsible, bad choices equals bad results, and good choices equal good results most of the time. If you make good choices, bad things are less likely to happen. This is the hardest lesson of all because it teaches them about sin and the imperfect world and the problem of suffering. Unfortunately, the message in school and most counseling is that if you do something good, you deserve something good in return. You deserve it. And this would be nice if it were true. 
But the world does not work this way and we do our children a disservice if we indoctrinate them with this false idea. Remember, you don't get a trophy just because you ate your peas. The truth is that the reward for doing the right thing is the knowledge that you've done the right thing. That's the reward. That's the essential reward. Sometimes, sometimes you're rewarded for doing the right thing and sometimes you're not and sometimes you're even punished unfairly for doing the right thing. For Christian parents, this is much easier to explain because our faith calls us to do right as an extension of who we are in Christ. Why should I do this, mom? Because we're Christians, that's why. That's how we, that's how we operate, that's, that's how we, you know, that's our response. It's easier for us. The doing of good is a function of our new life in Jesus, not some ethical bargaining tool to gain favor. So let's review very quickly. The goal of parenting, zero to three years old, the parent is in charge. You know, no, 500 times a day. The goal of parenting three to 11, years old, 11 year olds. As parents, we want our child to learn how to lead himself by, number one, realizing that he is responsible for his own life and you are giving him this responsibility little by little as he or she matures. Now if I wanted to do an object lesson here, I, didn't, you know, I would have a rope. And it's a long rope, you know, let's say it's 10 feet, right? And your child has one end of that rope and then there's only about a foot between you and the child and you have the rest of the rope and you're holding. They've got a little bit of rope. You know, they, can, they can slack it off or extend it for about a foot. And your job or our job as parents, especially during that three to 11, is to kind of let that rope, you know, oh, a foot and a half. Let's see how that works. You know? Two feet, three feet. I used to tell our children, my job is to help you be completely free of me. I'm, I'm giving you rope as I see you can handle rope. If, you can't, if I see you can't handle rope, I start pulling it back in. If I see you can handle the rope, then I, you know, I, I give it back out. You know, Emily, our uh, daughter, uh, 15 and a half years old, she had a driver's license, she had a car, she had a job that she worked sometimes at night to go to at 15. Because why? Because we could give, we felt we could give her a lot of rope. Not so much for others, won't mention any names. <laughs> But you see the imagery there? I would, I would expressly tell them, I am not against you being free. I'm not against you being independent. I am certainly not against you, you know, being your own person. I, I want that with all my heart and I'm giving you as much rope as I think that you can manage. So go for it, become independent of me, be free of me. I want that with all my heart. <laughs> Uh, should I add free with your own income? Not free on my nickel, but that's a whole other lesson. But you know what I'm saying. That, that I, I, I purposefully told them, my job is not to restrict your freedom. My job is to give you your freedom. But since I'm way older than you and I have more experience than you, we're going to allow me to be the judge of how much rope you get, not you. And you know, they managed. So we have to teach them to realize that they're responsible for their own life and you're giving them this responsibility. Secondly, that they are taking ownership of their choices and they are learning the lessons that these decisions teach them. No enabling, helping, guiding, providing what's sometimes missing but we allow them to own the consequences of their bad choices in all reasonableness. And then thirdly, 
they need to understand the motivation for making good, that the motivation for making good choices is faith, not reward, and accepting that the world is not always fair, but God will do justice in the end. The beautiful thing about us, about us as Christian parents, we have an answer to the hard questions. <laughs> you know, why, you know, why do little babies die of cancer? You know, we have the answer to that question, whereas others don't. So the early childhood and middle years are when parents teach their children how a compass works. This is how it works. You know, if you point it this way and you don't follow it and go that way, you make it, you, know, you, you, you teach them how it works. The teen years are when the parents help the child learn how to use that compass. And next week we're going to talk about the next stage, the terrible tweens. Another thing that didn't exist 100 years ago, didn't even exist 50 years ago, but now we have a new subclass. You know, it used to be you, know, you, you were a preteen, then you were a teen. Paul and Julia in, in our household used to argue, when, when, did, when were you a preteen? You know, Julia said, well, you're a preteen when you, you're two digits, like you're 10. You know? And Paul would say, no, 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 no. You're, you're only a preteen the year before you actually get into teenhood. You know? and this, this, was, this was the existential angst going on in our family. During those, uh, during those years. Okay, so next week, preparing also for the tween years. So come on back. We'll see you then.